Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Every week, week in, week out, whether I need to, whether I don't, whether I want to, whether I don't, I say the following words. What is new and exciting in your week? That... <laughs> What's new and exciting in your work? Come on, you could do it, James. <laughs> Go f*** yourself. <laughs> What's new and exciting in your world this week, Ant? I've got an interesting story about lionfish and profit motives. Can you have an interesting story about lionfish? Well, I think it's interesting. Here we go. <laughs> the profit motives are often held out as a bad thing when it comes to the environment. People say, well, you know, businesses have a profit incentive to pollute and destroy and all that. In fact, the problem with pollution typically, not always, but typically isn't a market failure, but rather a government failure. That is, that the government has failed to either adequately define or enforce property rights. Economists have many examples of the profit motive being used for good in the environment, so long as the government does its part in defining and enforcing property rights. And that brings us to the lionfish, and an example that's playing out right now in the Caribbean. Lionfish are a favorite in home aquariums. You've probably seen them. They're the spiky, multicolored things. They're quite beautiful, actually. They've become an invasive species that's destroying reef and shallow sea ecosystems in Florida and the Caribbean. Enter Inversa Leathers, which makes leather fashion products. Inversa discovered that the skin of the lionfish makes beautiful leather. So now Inversa is paying fishermen to harvest the lionfish. Inversa's profit-driven behavior is actually helping to save reef habitats. Are they going to get a pair of cowboy boots made out of these things? Yeah, probably so. We'll put a link to Inversa in the show notes. I don't know what they make. If there's anybody out there who is looking for a spokesman for lionfish cowboy <laughs> lionfish boots. cowboy boots. <laughs> you get in touch. I mean, the most exotic thing I've got thus far is elephants. So this would be way above that. But notice something interesting here. One source of the lionfish invasion comes from homeowners who had them in aquariums and then released them into the wild. Suppose, in an attempt to protect reef habitats, the government outlawed the trade in lionfish. So they looked at this and they said, look, people are buying lionfish for the home aquariums. They're releasing them into the wild. They're invasive species. So what we're going to do is something quite reasonable. We'll make it illegal to own, to buy, to sell the fish. And that sounds reasonable, but what it would do is to curtail the initial source of the invasion, because homeowners would no longer have lionfish that they could release into the wild, but it would do nothing about the existing stock of lionfish, which are out there invading and reproducing. Such a rule would also eliminate Inversa's profit incentive. It would prohibit Inversa from acquiring the fish, and so Inversa wouldn't be paying fishermen for the fish, so fishermen would have less of an incentive to capture the fish, and so there'd be more of them destroying the ecosystems. And the moral to the story is, when property rights are well-defined and enforced, and remember, this is a government function, not a market function, when property rights are well-defined and enforced, profit motives are almost always good for the environment. And everything else, too. Yeah, and all sorts of other things as well. I'm going to talk about something I hope is at least sufficiently different. I'm going to rattle off a number of things that comprise a list, see if you can figure out where I'm going with this. Hamburger buns, cheese, ground beef, cookies, ice cream, strawberries, chips, chicken breast, pork chops, pork and beans, lemonade, potato salad. Summer picnic? Fourth of July picnic. Boy, you're right up on top of things. So that's a human thing, but it's a wonder to me that you understand what that means. <laughs> Those products, when combined into a basket, will cost you $69.68. Last year, it cost 17% less. Hmm. 17%. And I want to point out that these are not exotic things. You can't look at them and say, well, you know, it's caviar. What can you do? No, we're talking about hamburgers. Right. Hamburgers, chicken, things you put on a grill, a little bit of ice cream. And boy, if that doesn't present to you the problem of inflation in very stark terms, I don't think anything ever will. We could say, let's not have a picnic, but you have to eat something. Whatever you want, it's going to cost you quite a lot more. This is a regressive tax. The poor get taken out back and shot because you know what, Aunt? I can afford 17% more and probably everybody in my neighborhood can, et cetera, et cetera. 
But if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you got a couple of kids and you've got real expenses in your life, you're going to have to make some very hard choices. If you're earning enough that you've got savings every paycheck, you can take that 17% cut out of your savings and be living the exact same life that you were before. It'll diminish your bank account ever so slightly month after month. But every month that we see a further increase like this is another month that the poor are being mistreated. The government did this. The inflation we see is an effect of having too many dollars in circulation. How did they get there? The Biden administration put five trillion of them there, thus making everybody else's worth considerably less. Yeah. And to be fair, he put five trillion after Donald Trump put whatever he put three to six trillion. I forget what the numbers are. Correct. This is not a matter of greed. It's not a matter of oil prices and oil companies. It's directly a function of the federal government spending money it doesn't have. And now the Federal Reserve is having to print the money so that the government can spend it. That's the problem. This always comes for the poor first. Over and over, Aunt, you and I get criticized for not caring about the poor sufficiently. That's actually ironic, James, given that you've spent a decent chunk of your life as the poor. Yeah, that's right. And I got to tell you, it really sucked. Mm -hmm. And before I get any angrier, we're going to move on to the foolishness of the week. Let's see if you can predict how this story is going to end. I'm going to read to you a Wall Street Journal headline. As gas prices surge, stations now hold up to $175 of your money when you swipe. They hold $175 of your money. Oh, while you, oh, I see what's happening. They're putting a hold on the credit card. There you go. And I think we'd have to contend that a credit card isn't going to cause a whole lot of trouble. Unless it last 175 puts you over your limit, which right. I doubt is really going to be an issue. Debit cards, on the other hand, these people are screwed. Because if you've got $100 in your account and you go to fill your tank, and last time I filled mine, it was $90. And you think to yourself, well, that will leave me with $10. Congratulations. It leaves you with an overdraft. And the overdraft fees are confiscatory. And this is what's going to happen all over the place. Now, I don't know how that works with overdraft fees and a debit card. But just to underline for listeners who may have been lost here, what happens is you go to fill up your tank, you swipe your card. But at that point that you swipe it, nobody knows how much gas you're going to be taking. And so the credit card company is going to, in effect, charge you $175, puts $175 hold in your credit card. You fill up and whatever you fill up, let's say you put 20 bucks in your tank, then the credit card company reverses whatever that is, $155. But the point is that they get the hold on you so that you can't swipe your card, get your gas and get the hell out of there. And you keep saying credit card, but again, it's debit cards that are going to cause all the problems because an overdraft on a debit card is the same as bouncing a check. For our listeners who are old enough to remember checks, I'm sure there's more than a few out there. I tend not to pay any attention to the hold on my cards with gas because it happens behind the scenes and you rarely think about it. A bunch of people are going to have no choice but to think about it. Unfortunately, they're going to have to think about it in retrospect. Where I do think about this is when you and I travel, right? We often are told at the front desk of a hotel that they're going to put a hold on our card. It's typically for the amount of a room or the last time I went, it was $50 for incidentals. Mm. And then you don't hit the mini bar or whatever else is in your room. You get it all charged back. But here we have, I think, a very clear set of circumstances where we can predict that a bunch of people are going to get absolutely screwed. This is not going to be the well-to-do. There's going to be people who live paycheck to paycheck, who map out how much gas they can afford. And I remember doing that calculation, right? right. I knew roughly how many miles per gallon my car got. I knew how many miles I had to drive back and forth to work. And I figured, okay, here's the maximum I could spend. Or I guess I'll have to just call out sick that that last day of the week. Right, right. So when you start looking at prices that surge, well, you also look at things like credit cards or debit cards grabbing up enough of your money to make good on a transaction if you don't. And incidentally, it was $125 prior to this. Something else that people say to me is that prices are going up because these companies, like in this example, the credit card company, has the opportunity to do this. Well, hang on. They always had the opportunity to do this. Hang on again, because there is no profit for them here. They're just protecting what they've already got invested into the transaction. That's right. And you know the thing that pisses me off with these people is that corporate greed, corporate greed. 
Why were corporations not greedy a year and a half ago? Right. What on earth makes you think that in 2022, oh my God, corporations just became quite gluttonous. They're off grabbing all the pennies they can now. But of course, back when we all kind of gathered together and sang Kumbaya with our corporate overlords. In boardrooms across the country, they all of a sudden discovered greed. <laughs> oh my God, we could be greedy and make more money here. Why didn't we never think of this? This is just like, and this is the only thing I'm going to say about the recent Supreme Court ruling that we all know about but will not name on this podcast anytime soon. People are out from the woodwork saying we can't let nine unelected justices run our country. Where were you two years ago? Where were you 50 years ago? Everybody loved it until they got an answer they didn't quite prefer. And the irony there is that I think the Supreme Court agrees what they did is they said, OK, we're not going to decide. Let the 50 states decide. All right. You've already gone too far and the hate mail will come. It will be like a I'm sorry. Flame, <laughs> we'll it'll, back off. It will be like a flamethrower at short distance. That's all we'll say on the topic. And I'll go a little further. Um, actually, I won't. <laughs> See, I'm going to we're done here. But I know who's going to bear the brunt of this. All of the politicians who caused this to happen will get up on podiums and they'll scream about doing right by the poor. But look at the track record. Mm -hmm. What is their revealed preference? How do they behave day in, day out when they think nobody's looking? And it's clear. The poor get it in the teeth every time. Maybe people should start identifying where the problems are. And it's the political class first. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Rob McDonald is professor of history at West Point and author of Confounding Father, Thomas Jefferson's Image in His Own Time. Professor McDonald has asked that we emphasize that his views are his own and do not represent those of the United States Military Academy. Rob, welcome back to Words and Numbers. It is great to be here. Thanks for having me. We have you on just about every 4th of July. We always seem to have you on when you're working on or have finished a book. One project that's in its early stages is a book that I am tentatively thinking I'm going to title Declared Independence, The Logic of Revolution. That sounds like fun. Yeah, it is, actually. I'm kind of excited about it. I've arrived at what I think is a pretty novel argument, and it's one that I'm a little surprised people haven't made because it emerges from a plain reading of the text of the Declaration of Independence. When we think about the Declaration of Independence, this wasn't written exclusively for our political elite. This was written in no small part for people to read and understand why we were undergoing this separation from Great Britain. I think that's absolutely true. The Declaration of Independence is one of those documents that has multiple audiences. One, maybe literally, is the king and the parliament. It proclaims that it's an expression to a candid world. So there's clearly a global audience, and I think certainly the members of the Continental Congress had France in mind yeah. because they understood that in the great power politics of the 18th century, if we were going to be at war, as we were with Great Britain, France was Britain's natural enemy and might enter into an alliance with us. So certainly they're an audience, but the American people are an audience. And at the beginning of 1776, let's say January, as opinion is just sort of coalescing around the idea that independence might be a step to take. John Adams estimated that you could probably divide Americans into thirds. One third favored independence, one third opposed it. They had problems perhaps with Great Britain, but they wanted to find a peaceful compromise, a peaceful solution. And then maybe a third of Americans were sitting on the fence and they were ambivalent. Not much different than we are today, <laughs> pretty much anything. It probably isn't. Yeah, it's not all that different, except during the course of beginning in April of 1775, when the British marched through Lexington to Concord and the War for Independence began. Of course, we call it the War for Independence now, back in 1775. We weren't calling it the War for Independence because we had not yet made that official leap, but it was certainly a war. 
and American and British blood was being spilled. That continued through the early months of 1776. As the war raged on, more and more Americans came around to the notion that we really should declare independence from Great Britain, that this was not a legitimate relationship with a legitimate government. Britain was not treating us the way a government is supposed to treat its people. So by the time you get to July 1776, more than a third are on board with the idea of independence. But there's still some stragglers out there. We know that throughout the war, there are going to be people who we today call loyalists. Back then, they were kind of sneered at as Tories, but they were people who remained loyal to Great Britain. And as many of those people we could win over, the better. And so certainly the Declaration of Independence, I think, aimed at not only consolidating the opinion of American patriots who favored independence, but also bringing on board people who hesitated. And Rob, maybe you can follow up on that with another related thought, because when we look at Jefferson's rough draft, that famous deleted indictment at the end where he lists all the grievances we have against King George III, and they're written more or less from least important to most important on that Mm -hmm. list. At the very bottom, he blames slavery on the king. He lays it right on the king's feet. And of course, that gets deleted as the rough draft gets polished because of that top line that we've got on the declaration, the unanimous declaration. Unanimity was really important. It was. The paragraph that you're referring to was written by Jefferson and signed off on by members of the Committee of Five. So the Committee of Five included Thomas Jefferson, as well as John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Robert Livingston in New York. They were the committee that had been entrusted with the task of drafting a Declaration of Independence should the Continental Congress decide that it was going to take that step. Of course, the lion's share of the work fell to Jefferson, and the paragraph penned in his hand that you're referring to read, he has waged, he being the king, George III, has waged cruel war against human nature itself violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. He's referring to the middle passage, the terrible transatlantic voyage that people suffered through. Then Jefferson writes, this piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep open a market where men capital M, capital E, capital N, where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this execrable commerce. So what Jefferson is laying at the feet of the king is the fact that many American colonies had passed measures either to end the transatlantic slave trade or to severely curtail the transatlantic slave trade. And the king essentially pocket vetoed all of those measures. Just to underline something you just said, when Jefferson said capital M-E-N men, he did not mean men versus women. He meant human beings. That's a great point. If anyone ever says, well, the Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal, but what about women? That's clearly a misreading of the sense of the word. Men meant mankind. Here is referring to African men and women and children who are captured and kidnapped from Africa and brought to American shores. Clearly, he's referring to all of humanity when he writes that all men are created equal. Something I heard you say many years ago that I think will be useful for our listeners, there's a contradiction here where on the one hand, he talks about human beings. But then when you get to the Constitution, there's this clear delineation where men are allowed to vote, but women aren't. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you had said years ago that stuck in my mind was that the Declaration was a philosophical document. It laid out the reasons for why we were declaring independence. But the Constitution is a different sort of animal. It was the nuts and bolts of how are we going to practically form a government. Is that a fair repetition of what you said? I think so. But I think maybe more to the point, here's the line in question. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So the rights that the Declaration declares all men share equally, those are natural rights, which is a different category of rights than, say, civil rights. 
So we should maybe talk a little bit about the state of nature. It's kind of important to my larger story. But the idea is that you go way back in time, back before there were any actual governments, back to caveman days, when we're completely uncivilized. Government might not exist, but we still have our God-given rights. We still have rights that if we were denied these rights, we would cease to function as human beings. We have our rights to life. Obviously, if somebody kills you, you're going to not function as a human being. We have our right to liberty. If somebody chains you up or ties you up or puts you in a cage, you can't function as you were designed to function as a human being with arms and legs to move about freely. And we have a right to property, John Locke says. We have the right in the state of nature to mix our labor with the things that we find in the state of nature. And when we do that, they become our property. So if James is a caveman, let's say, and he's living in the state of nature and he decides that he's kind of hungry and he wants to eat something and he takes a branch and he sharpens the end of it and turns it into a spear, that spear becomes his property. And then if he takes that spear and he plunges it into the belly of a deer, that deer and the meat of the deer, the skin of the deer, they become his property. He needs property to sustain his life. So we have these rights in the state of nature. These are natural rights. But caveman James doesn't have the right to a trial by jury because that's a different category of rights. There are no jury trials in the state of nature. There's no government in the state of nature. He doesn't have a right in the state of nature to vote because, again, there are no governments in the state of nature. There are no elections in the state of nature. So these civil rights that at the time of the American founding were obviously denied to women and denied to African-Americans and, frankly, denied to white men who didn't own the property that was necessary in most jurisdictions to qualify them for the franchise, they still had their natural rights. And government was still supposed to protect their natural rights. The question of how the government goes about protecting natural rights, that's a question that voters and the people they elect have to answer. But those natural rights are not in question. So the Declaration spoke to humans with respect to their natural rights, whereas the Constitution spoke to Americans with regard to their political rights. That is, the Constitution was an attempt to manifest principles that are laid out in the Declaration, albeit manifesting them in imperfect ways. I think so, yeah. We can say that even today, our civil rights are not applied equally to everyone. If you're 17 and a half years old, you can't vote. If you're a felon in many states, you're denied the right to the franchise. A lot of these rights are still conditional. Not everyone who goes to trial has the right to a jury trial. That's only for certain kinds of court cases. These civil rights generally maybe have some asterisks next to them. But natural rights, at least in theory, are rights that no human being can legitimately be denied. Right. Now, we were being denied these rights. That's our argument. Great Britain was denying our natural rights. And because it was denying our natural rights, that's one of the things that justified our decision to declare ourselves independent. These natural rights arguments are tougher than people might imagine, because if we return to Locke's state of nature, and I take offense that I'm the caveman here, <laughs> but so be it. Caveman James is wandering about with my spear, and who do I see but that knucklehead Anthony Davies lurking around, and he takes a look at me. It's kind of a bad look, and I think to myself, Anthony Davies is going to kill me. I better get over there and kill him right now. And as far as Locke is concerned, that's perfectly fine. And that's the kind of thing that we leave the state of nature over. We give up our rights to defense in this limited way and a bunch of other rights in order to enter civil society, which keeps us fat and happy, for lack of a better term. That's right. So that's why we have government in the first place. We have government to secure these rights. We have these rights in the state of nature. They are part of our humanity. Locke would say they're a gift from God. But securing these rights is not always an easy thing. Right. Ant just gave you a nasty look. It could have been much worse, of course. Right. He could have actually killed you. Or he could have stolen your deer skin. Or you've been tending this wonderful campfire and cooking up some delicious venison. He could have knocked you over the head and taken away the meat that you had prepared. That was your property. He could have taken your spear from you while you were knocked out. He could have kidnapped you. So he could have violated all those different rights. As people discover this, it dawns upon them, first, well, there are other people out there. And second, there are some bad people out there that we need to defend against. Maybe we should unite with other good people 
who will mutually agree to protect each other's rights. So that's why we have government, according to John Locke. What do you want us to take away from what you're building? Thank you for asking, because I think the original point that I'm making is this. In some ways, we already had been declared independent by Great Britain itself. Hence the proposed title of the book, Declared Independent. There was in 1774 and 1775 and early 1776 emerging an argument that essentially our independence was a fait accompli, that already in reality, we were being treated as an independent people by a government that had ceased to perform the functions that government is supposed to perform. If the purpose of government is to secure your rights, the British government sure wasn't doing that. And if you look at the structure of the Declaration of Independence, you have the first paragraph where it essentially lays out the purpose of the Declaration to, to declare to a candid world why we're about to make this declaration. Then you have the second long paragraph that I read from, which is all about the purpose of government. But then you have the list of grievances. And this list of grievances is in some ways a history of the imperial crisis, where Jefferson lays out the various offenses that have been committed against the rights of Americans by Parliament and the King. And then you come to an inflection point in that list. And this, I think, is really an important part that a lot of people miss. And this is what my project aims to emphasize. The Declaration states, the king, he, has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. The king has abdicated government here. He's already declared us independent because he's not acting as a government that protects our rights. Instead, you go into the second half of the list of grievances, and that begins with the charge, he has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. And then the declaration goes on to point out that the king is hiring foreign mercenaries in the form of Hessians, and Americans are being impressed upon the high seas and forced to serve in the British Navy. The British government is encouraging Native Americans to attack us. And then you have the charge about slavery, which not only points out the injustice of the institution of slavery, but concludes by pointing out that the British government has extended an offer to American slaves who are enslaved on the plantations of people resisting the British government. If they will run away and join with the British army and fight the American people, they will be given freedom once the war is complete. So this is Lord Dunmore's 1775 proclamation. Dunmore was, of course, the last royal governor of Virginia. So all of these charges basically get us to the point where Americans in 1776 realize that, yeah, if the purpose of government is to protect life and liberty and property, the British government hasn't been doing that for a long time. So the British government really isn't functioning as a government. The king has abdicated his role. And so if you get to the end of the Declaration of Independence, you get to this incorporation of the original resolution that Richard Henry Lee had made a month earlier on the floor of Congress, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Not only ought they be free and independent states, they are free and independent states because the king has essentially declared them independent by abdicating his role as the protector of our liberty. Rob, I think you're doing yeoman's work here on material that people don't really know, but should. Everybody knows that opening salvo in the Declaration, but by the time they get to that list of offenses, their eyes glaze over and they don't want to read it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think anything you can do to bring those things out is a fight well worth having. And then there's this other thing that people, I think, don't quite get. The Americans understood themselves as political entities not subject to parliamentary rule. They were subject to the rule of the king. So it doesn't matter what Parliament said. They never had a role in this instance. Mm -hmm. And how do they prove this? They point to Ireland, a conquered country, far worse off than we are in North America. And they were permitted to have their own legislature. So why are we not? We're a settled country and we're not allowed to have our legislature. You got to be kidding me. And if they had addressed that probably within minutes of people landing here, I don't think any of the rest of it would naturally follow. And you'd probably get some trouble down the road when we realize that the U.S. is going to be bigger as an entity than Great Britain ever was. But still, you see the lines clearly drawn right from the beginning. 
and just as galling as the example of Ireland is the example of French Canada. Yeah. You know, the French Canadians have a legislature the same time that American legislatures are being suspended. That these conquered people, conquered not only by the British, but by Americans during the French and Indian War, just 15 years prior to the Declaration of Independence, that they would have more rights and more liberties than these British people who moved to America was utterly stunning to them. And a clear wake up call that the government that they had believed to be the freest on the planet was not actually protecting their rights, not protecting their liberties, that the only way that they could actually have a real legitimate government that did those things was if they acknowledged that they had already been thrown into a state of independence. John Adams wrote about this in March of 1776 in a letter to General Horatio Gates of the Continental Army. He wrote about how recent British legislation amounted to a complete dismemberment of the British Empire. It throws 13 colonies out of the royal protection and makes us independent in spite of all our supplications and entreaties. And then he writes, it is very odd that Americans should hesitate at accepting such a gift from Parliament. In other words, Parliament has already made us independent. We just need to acknowledge that fact. And he's making that argument in March. By July, that argument will carry the day. It just strikes me that this was boneheadedly stupid on the part of the king, the parliament, that there was already a model out there. Mm -hmm. You referenced Ireland, French, Canada. Why not just allow the colonists their own parliament and be done with it? Well, it's interesting. James brought up this constitutional question of exactly what role, if any, parliament had in the government of American affairs. And a lot of people were willing to accept that Parliament did have the rightful authority to govern for the empire, and we were part of the British Empire, that it had the rightful authority to govern, for example, trade on the high seas. But as soon as you got to American shores, it was only legitimate for our own colonial parliaments, our own colonial legislatures, where we had actually elected representatives to govern for us. So there was, in the mind of Americans, this middle ground where we could accept the government of parliament in some situations, essentially for foreign policy. But internally, it's only right that we govern ourselves because we don't have representation in parliament. We can't be just ruled by their whim. And yet parliament steadfastly rejected that argument throughout what historians call the imperial crisis. So the imperial crisis basically begins as the French and Indian War comes to an end. And you have examples like the Proclamation Line of 1763, which prohibits American colonists from settling west of the Appalachian Mountains. You have the Stamp Act of 1765, which is Parliament's imposition of a tax upon various goods that Americans have to purchase. That They have no way of opting out. They have no way of vetoing this measure. They're not consulted. Representative assemblies aren't included in this decision-making process. It continues again. Even after the Stamp Act is repealed in 1766, the British passed what they call the Declaratory Act. They declare that Parliament has the right to govern for Americans in all cases whatsoever. And that just sends chills down people's spine because it completely overturns what they had come to accept as the British Constitution. We always believed that we got to govern ourselves internally. And then, time after time, example after example, the Townsend Acts. In 1767, were a series of taxes on lead, glass, paint, paper, and tea. And then you get the response to things like the Boston Tea Party in 1773. In 1774, the British respond with what they call the Coercive Acts, what we call the Intolerable Acts, shutting down Boston Harbor, dissolving the Massachusetts legislature, outlawing town meetings. Some people began to claim that they were being treated. This gets back to James's comment. They were being treated like Irishmen, that they were being governed at gunpoint, that they were being treated like a conquered people, an occupied people. And of course, remember, too, that by this point, the people of Boston were an occupied people. Since 1768, British troops had been stationed among them in a time of peace, which in their eyes violates the English Bill of Rights. And when you think about a series of missteps, it's almost as if they all went to a bookstore and bought a book called How to Lose an Empire for Dummies. <laughs> And you can't have a war for independence unless you have British troops in America. This calls to mind the 1770 so-called Boston Massacre, which wasn't even a massacre. 
There was a poor British sentry who was in March of 1770 standing guard outside the customs house. A group of kids started pelting him with snowballs and sticks and stones and no doubt words that hurt his feelings. (laughs) And then reinforcements arrived and the crowd grew. And it's not just kids anymore, but it's a whole bunch of Boston ruffians. And they're not just throwing sticks and stones and snowballs, but oyster shells and bricks and rocks and pieces of wood. And then for reasons that we don't fully understand, all the church bells in Boston started to ring. And that's a sign of a public emergency. And of course, in 18th century Boston, a city made largely of wood, what's the emergency that people fear the most? Fire, someone yells. And one of the British soldiers does. And all the others do. And you have 11 bloody people lying on the ground. And five of them, unfortunately, are going to die. So a terrible event. But it wouldn't have happened had the British essentially sent soldiers to America with no real job to do except to stir up trouble. And Rob, this is kind of fascinating. It gets to something you talked about a little while ago. At the center of this issue, who do we find once the dust settles? John Adams, again. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. He's always right there. And he's got this uncanny ability to figure out where to be at every step. I think a lot of people here don't know that he represented the British. Yeah, a little bit of trepidation because this job would put a target on his back for a while, at least make him the most unpopular man in all of Boston. But yes, he did act as the defense counsel for the British officer in charge of these soldiers. They were tried in separate trials. He was able to get a jury, a Boston jury, to find the officer not guilty and to find not guilty all but I think two or three of the soldiers who were convicted of manslaughter, but under a legal procedure known as the benefit of the clergy, they essentially were branded with M's between their thumb and forefinger, set free from jail. And if they committed manslaughter again, they would then face the death penalty, but they were able to walk. So it was a far better outcome for these British soldiers than anyone anticipated. And I think John Adams saw that as a great victory, not so much for the British troops in Boston, but a great victory for the American claim that we really were capable of governing ourselves. That's right. And the American sense that we were upholding traditional English liberties far better than the government, than the regime that was in place in London. And the stunning question that they all chewed on was at what point that they left Great Britain free citizens, did they become slaves before they hit the American soil? Because there's some kind of bad magic that has to be happening Mm -hmm. in order to follow the British logic. When you think about dress rehearsals for the 1776 Declaration of Independence, I think uh, it's logical to look back at the 1775 Declaration of the Causes and Necessities of Taking of Arms that was co-written by Thomas Jefferson and John Dickinson. And then a dress rehearsal for that document was Jefferson's 1774 Summary View of the Rights of British America. And Jefferson takes the history all the way back to the founding of Virginia at Jamestown in 1607. And as he points out, writing about the original inhabitants of Virginia, for themselves they came. For themselves, they conquered. For themselves alone, they had a right to hold. In other words, we weren't colonized by the British government. British people acting as individuals, privately funded, voluntarily chose to cross the Atlantic Ocean and in the wilds of America, in other words, in a state of nature, they created their own government and they voluntarily gave their allegiance to the king. That was their constitutional connection with Great Britain. But there's a clear implication here. If they voluntarily gave their allegiance to the king, their allegiance to the king could be voluntarily withdrawn. And that's the threat that Jefferson's 1774 summary view makes. And when we look at that 1774 piece, it looks revolutionary. It smells revolutionary. But Jefferson wrote it quite a number of years before. He did. And I have to point out that he wrote it for the Virginia Convention. So the Virginia House of Burgesses had passed a resolution of sympathy for the people of Massachusetts who were suffering under the Intolerable Acts. The governor of Virginia, the royal governor, Lord Dunmore, he wanted to express his solidarity with the British government. So he dissolved the House of Burgesses. They reconvened as this extra legal body that they called the Virginia Convention. And in the summer of 1774, Jefferson had written his summary view as a resolution to be passed by the Virginia Convention. It was read before the Virginia Convention, and a lot of people 
you know, including some people who would be stalwart patriots, stalwart revolutionaries a couple of years down the road. A lot of people thought that it was too much too soon, that it went a little bit too far. And yet there were many members of the Virginia Convention who thought that it was a fantastic piece of political theory and political argument. And so they arranged to have it published as a pamphlet. And it was republished in a lot of different locations, including London itself. So Jefferson's 1774 summary view, although his name was not on the cover, kind of introduced his ideas to not only the American people, but also to people on the other side of the Atlantic as well. We're coming down the home stretch here, as we do every year on the 4th of July with you. And you always tell us a pretty nice story to close the show. What have you got for us this year? Well, you're laying a heavy burden upon me, but it's no heavier than the burden that was imposed upon the members of the Continental Congress. I mean, just think of the fix that they were in. They fundamentally considered themselves to be Englishmen who believed in English liberty to a degree far greater than the English government. I mean, that's the terrible irony of it all. They were better at being English, better at upholding English rights in America than the regime that was in place on the other side of the ocean. And they had patiently pled with the British Parliament for 15 years to basically cut out all of these acts that increasingly are imposing restrictions upon their liberties and violating their rights. This was all kind of theoretical until 1775, when the actual war began and when blood began to be shed. And as they're deliberating in Philadelphia, one of the largest armadas in the history of mankind was arriving at New York Harbor. Thousands of British sailors, thousands of British troops upon dozens of British warships were arriving. This was really a moment of decision. Were they going to choose liberty and risk their lives, or were they going to acquiesce to what they considered slavery, the inability to have control over your life and your liberty and your property? They made the tough choice, and it wasn't a foregone conclusion that they would make it. There was a test vote taken on July 1st, 1776, and Pennsylvania voted against independence. Delaware was essentially tied. There was one delegate from Delaware voting in favor, one against. South Carolina was voting against. And then over the course of the next day, a bunch of things happened. There's a little bit of fog concealing some of it. Some of it is pretty clear. Caesar Rodney of Delaware rode throughout the night through a thunderstorm. He arrived the morning of July 2nd, still wearing boots with spurs. And he tilted Delaware in favor of the question of independence. South Carolina came around to the idea of independence. And John Dickinson, who was in many respects a forceful advocate for the liberties of Americans and a fierce critic of British imperial policy, he just couldn't bring himself to make the leap and accept the Declaration of Independence. But he could bring himself to understand that so many of his colleagues in the Continental Congress were on board with the idea that he and a few other like-minded people from Pennsylvania absented themselves from the Pennsylvania delegation, now led by Benjamin Franklin, who voted that Pennsylvania was going to accept independence. John Adams would later write that it was like making 13 clocks all strike at the same time. Now we're all synchronized through our cell phones. And we forget. In the 18th century, clocks were not nearly as precise as they are now. We didn't have time zones. We didn't have any of that stuff. To make 13 18th century clocks strike all at once, it was almost a miracle. And so we declared our independence on July 2nd, 1776. And then the task was reviewing this declaration that had been prepared by Thomas Jefferson and his colleagues on the Committee of Five. That was proclaimed to the world on July 4th, 1776. And America, which they argued had already been made independent by the king, now accepted that fact and proclaimed it to the world. Happy 4th of July, Rob. Thank you. Happy 4th of July, you guys. Thanks for doing this, Rob. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows, it may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried.
You tried. That's right. Till next week. Can't take it easy. See you next week, James.